Shabbat Shalom. I just want to welcome everyone to the Sabbath Day Conference Call. This is Barbara, and I'm serving as your host today, and Brother Pete is here as your co-host. We want to welcome all our family and friends that are here with us and those that are listening to this YouTube recording. And we invite everyone to go to our website, LunarSabbathDay.com, for more information about the Creator's Sabbath and the Creator's Feast Days. And today our topic is, what is Shavuot? And you've heard it called Feast of Weeks and Pentecost. And so today I just wanted to uh, kind of go over what do we do on Shavuot. The Bible uh, describes Shavuot holiday as an agricultural celebration, the festival of reaping. And uh, there are a lot of verses about Shavuot, but here are a few, uh, and Brother Pete will read these. Jeremiah 5.24 they don't, they don't say to themselves, We should fear Yahweh our Elohim. He sends rain at the right time, the autumn rain and the spring rain. He makes sure that we have harvest season. Deuteronomy 16, 9-11 You shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you put the sickle to the grain. Then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks to Yahweh your Elohim with a tribute of a freewill offering from your hand, which you shall give as Yahweh your Elohim blesses you. You shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your gates, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are among you, at the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to make his name abide. Isaiah 9, 2-3 The people walked in darkness, have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as the people rejoice at the harvest. Each of the three pilgrimage festivals marks a new period in the agricultural season. Passover is also known as Hag Aviv, the spring festival, which marks the beginning of the new planting season. The basic meaning of the word Aviv is a stage of growth in grain when the seeds have reached full size but yet have not dried. And Shavuot is Hag HaKasser, or the harvest festival of reaping. It's when the first crop of the season is ready. And this happens at the time of Shavuot. And Sukkot, the next agricultural step is for all of the crops to be gathered. And this happens with the third pilgrimage festival, Sukkot, which is also referred to as the festival of gathering. And that's Hag Hasif. And uh, so over here is a little chart of the springtime feast, the summer, Pentecost, and fall. Three annual feasts, Exodus 23, 14 through 16. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month of Aviv. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. So that brings us to the three pilgrimage festivals, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Shavuot is a biblical festival known in English as the Feast of Weeks, or maybe you've heard it called Pentecost in the churches. Shavuot is a pilgrimage feast. In Hebrew, a chag or a hog 
as a Hag, Shavuot is one of the three annual biblical festivals on which every male Israelite is commanded to make a pilgrimage to the temple. Shavuot is also referred to in the Torah as Hag Ha Bikr, the Feast of Harvest, and that's in Exodus 23:16, and uh, Yam Ha Bikurim, the Day of the First Fruits, Numbers 28:26. So Shavuot is unique among the biblical festivals and then it's not given a fixed calendar date. Instead, after the wave sheaf offering, the 16th day of the first month during unleavened bread, which is right here, the day after the Sabbath and Passover there. Okay, so um, instead, okay, this at, on the 16th day of the first month during unleavened bread, we are commanded after seven Sabbaths complete to count an additional 50 days. This time period is known today as the counting of the Omer, counting of the weeks between the first barley harvest and the Feast of Weeks. The commencement of this period was marked in Temple times by the bringing of the Omer offering that is known as the Festival of Shavuot as described in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 23, 15 through 21. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave offerings, two wave loaves of two-tenths deals, and they shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto Yahweh. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock, and two rams, and they shall be for a burnt offering unto Yahweh with their meat offering and their drink offering, even a male by, made by fire, a sweet savor unto Yahweh. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before Yahweh with, with the two lambs. And they shall be holy unto Yahweh for the priest. And you shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. You shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. So this is a chart of the um, Feast of Shavuot. And it shows you um, the morrow after the Sabbath, with the Sabbath being the 15th after Passover day. And then it shows you um, counting the seventh Sabbath complete and then starting the 50-day count, which puts you at the 29th or 28th day of the fourth month. And we have done quite a few uh, videos about this, so I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. So the timing of the harvest is important. It is the summer wheat harvest, not the spring wheat, as we were taught. Uh, a special offering is brought, and that's two loaves of bread of the new crop of wheat. And here are the videos we have done several, uh, when is Shavuot and how to count to Pentecost. These are on our website and our YouTube channel, and also on our website is the article uh, re-examining the traditional count to Pentecost, and I'll leave these links below also. So how Shavuot is celebrated? That has always been a question for me. I've kept the feast a lot of years, and it's like, uh, how is this feast celebrated? Uh, the Torah seems to speak of Shavuot as a harvest holiday. First fruits are brought. Special offering is brought, two loaves of bread of the new crop of wheat. 
And we are commanded to be happy, rejoice together with the poor, the stranger, and the fatherless. And that's from Deuteronomy 16.11. Which is, and rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. You, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, the Levite in your towns, and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows living among you. Remember also on this day to remember that we were slaves in Egypt. In Deuteronomy 15:15, 15, 15, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and Yahweh your Elohim redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. So there's the biblical Shavuot, which we know it says in there, it's the harvest festival of first fruits. And we're to be happy and rejoice and remember those less fortunate. And remember that we were slaves in Egypt. And it's also a holy convocation. And uh, you've um, all, we've all heard of the rabbinic Shavuot. That's really all we've known. Uh, and that is celebrate the giving of the Torah, the Ten Commandments. And the Shavuot Torah reading is the Book of Ruth. Uh, in the course of time, a new theme was added to Shavuot, uh, namely the commemoration of the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Uh, this celebration originated in the exilic period of the Jewish history. After destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans in the year 70 CE, sacrificial rites and the Bikurim ritual involving bringing first fruits to the temple were abolished. So uh, Shavuot is all about the first fruits, being happy, rejoicing, a holy convocation. But uh, now we do some things different also. Because of the agricultural and spiritual significance of the holiday, there are many Shavuot traditions that celebrate both Yahweh's people receiving the Torah and the Hebrew Harvest Festival. Unlike most other Jewish holidays, Shavuot has no prescribed Torah commandments other than the traditional festival observances, such as having a joyous feast, special holiday prayers, and, abs and abstention from work. The Bible does not associate any historical event with Shavuot, although in later times it was connected with the giving of the Ten Commandments at Sinai. The book of Exodus says that the revelation at Sinai took place several weeks after the Israelites arrived in the Sinai desert. And you can look that up in Exodus 19 and 20. Shavuot is the day of Jehovah's people. Oh, excuse me, Shavuot is the day of Yahweh's people recall standing at Mount Sinai and receiving the Torah from him. It's an awesome occasion commemorating our spiritual pin pinnacle as a people. So Shavuot Torah reading. The book of Ruth is read on Shavuot. The story of Ruth mostly takes place during the harvest season, Ruth 122. Uh, so we read it on the harvest festival of Shavuot. Uh, Ruth was a convert entering the covenant with Jehovah of her own accord. The Israelites did the same when they entered their covenant with Jehovah on Shavuot by receiving the Torah. So um, if you've been in groups, um, that's what we usually read. Ruth chapter Go ahead, one. Brother Pete. Uh -huh. Ruth follows Naomi. As our story opens, the land of Israel is hit by a terrible drought, and so a man named El Elimelech, Elimelech moves his family, his wife Naomi, and his two sons, Mahalon and Chihlon, from the Israelite city of Bethlehem to the foreign land of Moab. In Moab, Elimelech dies, and the two sons marry Moabite women, Orf Orpha and Ruth. Ten years pass by, and now the sons die too, leaving Naomi in Moab with her two daughters-in-law. 
Now, bereaved of her of husband and both sons, Naomi decides to return to Bethlehem in the land of Israel. Initially, her two daughters-in-law follow her, but she urges them to turn back to, to their own land, saying that she cannot provide for them either financially or producing new sons for them to marry. Eventually, Orpha turns back uh, to Moab, but Ruth clings to Naomi and pledges her eternal loyalty to one of, in one of the most famous speeches in the entire Hebrew Bible. Where, where it says, <laughs> Ruth pledges to Naomi, Do not urge me to leave you, to turn back and to follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus and more may Yahweh do to me, if anything but death parts me from you. Well, chapter 2, uh, Ruth finds food and a man. Uh, Ruth and Naomi are two widows newly arrived back in Bethlehem, and finances are tight. In ancient Israel, farmers were required to leave gleanings in their fields and that sheaves of grain that fell on the ground during the harvest process for the poor to collect. And Ruth determines that she will go to glean and to feed herself and her mother-in-law. Ruth ends up gleaning in the field of Naomi's distant relative, Boaz. And Boaz notices Ruth and inquires after her. And when he learns of her loyalty to Naomi, he makes special arrangements for her comfort and even invites her to lunch and tells his harvesters to intentionally leave a little extra grain on the ground for her. By the end of the day, Ruth has collected a huge amount of grain, and she ends up gleaning in Boaz's field for the entire harvest season. Chapter 3, A Midnight Plan Naomi is concerned about Ruth's future and determines that she should get married again. In ancient Israel, an unmarried woman was usually without much financial support, and without a child, Ruth could not hand down any family property in the name of her dead husband. Ordinarily, a childless widow would marry the, marry the next of kin who was required to raise up seed for the dead husband. Naomi asked Ruth to dress finely and lie down at Bio, Be, Boaz's threshing floor in the middle of the night, presumably at the end of the harvest. Boaz will have a party and end up asleep in the same threshing floor. In time, in fact, that's precisely what happens, and Ruth snuggles in next to him and uncovers his feet. When Boaz wakes up, he is surprised and doesn't even recognize her at first, but when she asks him to be her redeeming kinsman, he couldn't be more pleased. He tells her that there is a closer relative who would have first priority to become her new husband, but if that man does not wish to... Uh, wish to, he will be more than glad to step into that role. He sends her home with even more grain. So Boaz claims Ruth as a wife, chapter 4. Uh, in this chapter, Boaz goes to the city gate and meets the kinsman who is closer to Naomi than himself in his first claim on Naomi's property and Ruth's hand. He talks the man out of claiming the land and Ruth. The kinsman formalizes the agreement by removing his sandal before witnesses. This signifies that he has abandoned his claim to Ruth and Boaz and is, leaves Boaz free to marry her. Immediately, Boaz claims Ruth as his wife and declares that their children will carry on the name of Ruth's deceased husband. And indeed, Ruth conceives and she gives birth to Obed, who in turn became the father of Jesse, who in turn became the father of King David, the greatest king of Israel, and the one from whose line the Messiah would be born. These are explanations for the custom of the reading of the book of Ruth on Shavuot, the festival commemorating the giving of the Torah at Sinai. Okay. Both the Torah, which was given at Shavuot, 
and Ruth are all about kindness and generosity. At Sinai, Israel took upon itself obedience to the Torah. Ruth likewise takes its obligation to the Torah upon herself. Shavuot is connected to the harvest, so too is the story of Ruth. Reading Ruth teaches us that actions, not mere study, are the essence of righteous living or goodness. Boaz exemplified this teaching through his actions and his observance of the commands of Torah. So Shavuot is one of the pilgrimage festivals of Jehovah listed in the Bible in Leviticus 23. Shavuot is a summer harvest feast, first fruits, and the two loaves of bread from the new wheat crop. We are told to be happy and rejoice and remember those less fortunate. Remember we were slaves in Egypt, and Shavuot is a holy convocation. Shavuot is a time to remember the covenant or formal agreement between Jehovah and Israel at Mount Sinai. This is a joyous time since it is the moment at which Jehovah and Israel entered into a figurative marriage with each other, the hopeful beginning of their relationship. So uh, for more information about the Feast of Jehovah, please go to our website, and you can access materials directly related to the feast and the Father's calendar. So I just want to thank everybody for listening, and I hope you'll all be back next week, uh, yeah, willing.